Hi, welcome to Chapter 4, Sensory and Perceptual Development in Infancy. We're going to look at um, physical changes in the baby, health and wellness, infant mortality, sensory skills. These are the objectives. I'm not going to read them all to you, but these are what we'll be covering in today's presentation. First of all, uh, with the infant's brain, there is a rapid development during the first two years. The medulla regulates uh, uh, vital functions such as heartbeat and respiration, attention, sleeping, waking, elimination, and movement of the head and neck. The cortex is responsible for perception, body movement, thinking, and language. Um, I encourage you to uh, continue with, uh, with my virtual life of your child. Uh, watch it up to 18 months. Uh, be sure to watch the videos. There's some pretty interesting videos in there as well. Uh, also in this PowerPoint, if you watch the manual, uh, the PowerPoint of this video, you can click the links and, and see the, the, the videos that I've um, embedded into the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, you won't be able to open them on this presentation. You have to go to the regular PowerPoint and open it up. <clears throat> okay, next. Uh, this shows the uh, infant's brain. And the, the medulla and the midbrain are largely developed at birth. In the first two years after birth, it's primarily the cortex that develops with each neuron, going through the enormous uh, growth of dendrites and a vast increase of synapses. And you'll find that in your book, Figure 4.1. <clears throat> um, this chart looks at what's called synaptogenesis and synaptic pruning. Early in development, each muscle cell seems to develop a synaptic connection with several motor neurons in the spinal cord. But after the pruning process has occurred, each muscle fiber is connected to only one neuron. Now, some neurophysiologists have suggested that the initial surge of synapse formation follows a built-in pattern, and that's from Greenboro, uh, Greenough um, et al., 1987. The organism seems to be programmed to create certain kinds of neural connections and does so in abundance, creating redundant pathways. Now, according to this argument, um, pruning that takes place beginning at around 18 months, it's a response to experience, resulting in selective retention, of the most efficient pathways. So pruning is where the, the baby eliminates unused neural pathways and connections. But what it does is it makes room for, um, uh, as the baby learns new patterns and learns to use uh, different movements, it creates the most efficient pathway for itself um, in creating movements. <clears throat> um, there's a current research out there about um, about using TVs for uh, infants under two years old. 90% uh, of US babies watch TV and other forms of video entertainment. Um, when they're exposed to, an, some of them are exposed to an average of five hours a day. Um, research says excessive television watching during these first three years is linked to reduced social interactions as well as ADHD. Now, the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, call for no television before the age of two. The parents should focus on quality when selecting resources. Now decide for yourself. Um, do you believe, agree with the uh, recommendation that children under two should not watch TV at all? Or do you think they go too far and there's a place for television in the lives of toddlers? Um, that'll be one of our discussion questions. And um, next is the term neuroplasticity. Um, this is a brain's ability to change in response to experience. Now, rat infants reared in a highly stimulated environment have denser network of neurons, dendrites, and synaptic connections, which uh, reinforces the, uh, the importance of the environment. Young infants need sufficient stimulation in order to, in order for their environment to maximize the early period of rapid growth and plasticity. So, in other words, we should use it or lose it. Um, that in an intellectually challenging environment creates more complex network of synapses. Um, also, when there's changes of uh, physiological functioning, developmental changes in the brain across the lifespan, um, changes, for instance, um, the brains of infants are very malleable. They can bounce back from uh, injury a little bit faster than uh, when we get older, we're less likely to bounce back as fast. Um, so we, uh, as you get older, um, you have less plasticity as compared to infants. 
Um, myelin is the insulating layer of proteins and fatty substances. Um, the, it, what happens is myelin forms a sheath that covers uh, individual axons. It provides insulation, speeds up the neural uh, processes. Uh, it also, here's some big words for you, it also follows a uh, cephalocaudal and proximodistal um, patterns. Cephalocaudal means from head to toe, proximodistal means from near to far. Um, timing of uh, formation of uh, myelin is most rapid during the first two years. Uh, it continues at a slower pace throughout childhood and adolescence. Also, um, reticular formation is part of the brain that regulates attention. Uh, this continues to develop during this age as well. Um, baby is born with what's called adaptive reflexes that aid survival. Um, these would be the sucking reflex, um, so the baby can naturally uh, figure out how to eat, uh, withdrawal from pain, uh, opening and closing of the pupil, and reaction to, to light. Um, these adaptive uh, reflexes, um, when they're weak or absent, it's a warning of possible uh, neuronal development problems. Um, so if the baby doesn't uh, show those reflexes, um, that would be, you know, it could show some problems. Uh, some reflexes, such as sucking, will be replaced by voluntary behaviors. Others are available throughout the lifespan. Here's a cool little video that you can watch uh, on a PowerPoint. Um, about newborn's reflexes. Next are primitive reflexes. Um, they're controlled by the less sophisticated part of the brain. Um, the primitive reflexes are uh, controlled by the medulla and uh, midbrain. And um, one would be the, the moral or startle reflex. The other one is the Babinski reflex, with the baby curls its toes when stimulated. And um, these reactions should disappear by six to eight months. Uh, it may indicate neuro neurological problems if uh, these reflexes are persistent after six to eight months. Next is uh, states of consciousness, uh, baby sleeping. Sleep patterns are individualized from baby to baby. But some babies may not develop nighttime patterns until one year of age. So patterns of sleep and wakefulness, that'll eventually stabilize with age. So don't panic if the baby's sleep pattern is not very consistent. By eight weeks of age, the babies begin to sleep through the night. Yay, get you some sleep. Um, by six months of age, babies average 14 hours of sleep per day. Um, there's a clear nighttime patterns and daytime naps are established by them. But uh, think about that, 80% of the time that baby is sleeping. Um, this shows the, the cycle of uh, sleep, states of sleep and wakefulness. Uh, most infants move through these states in the same sequence every two hours. So they, they get a little fussy, then they drowsy, and they go to sleep. And then there's light sleep, and then there's like alert wakefulness, and then they get fussy and get tired and go to sleep again. Kind of a nice life. Now, babies crying is a normal part of... Uh, uh, baby's development. There's different types of cries. Um, there's a basic cry that signals hunger, um, and uh, it's more of a rhythmic pattern. And then there's an angry cry, and it could be louder, more intense. And then there's a pain cry, and this would be caused by an abrupt onset. Um, the colic baby, this is where the, uh, the pattern may involve intense bouts of crying for really no immediate apparent reason. Um, and this, these bouts of crying may be for as much as three hours a day um, and starts to appear about two weeks and then the good news is that it disappears by three to four months of age. But this is a real test for parents to be patient, to be loving, um, to know that as long as you know, to keep the baby comfortable, keep the baby doing what they need to do, the baby needs to do, um, care for the baby and um, maybe do some relaxation exercises to help you through it. But the good news, it, it does disappear after a while. Okay, uh, next is um, uh, baby's growth. By age of one, they are 10 to 12 inches of growth. Uh, the infants basically triple their body weight uh, in a very uh, in that short amount of time by age of one. So from the time of birth to one years old, triple the weight. 
around the age of two, this is a good time to measure the height of your child because if you multiply that height by around age of two, it gives you a pretty good um, indicator of the, the child's height when they're an adult. So measure the height at age two, multiply by two. That's going to be the average height of that child uh, or predicted height of that child. Um, their heads are still much larger than adults, uh, so they have a, a body to grow into that huge head and a brain to grow into that huge head. Um, here's a cool video on uh, motor development. Next, um, on growth and motor skills, uh, female infants actually have an advantage over boys in fine motor skills. And this is a study by Tanner in 1990. Um, and then male infants have an advantage over girls in gross motor skills that they tend to develop a little bit faster. But overall, um, it's important to know that they follow a step-by-step. -step, um, they all go through the same stages and, and eventually uh, progress through those skills. Here's uh, some videos on motor develop, fine motor development and gross motor development. So fine motor development would be the baby's ability to feed themselves. Um, gross motor development is be able to, to move about, to crawl, to walk. Now, something to think about. Um, there's something called the Dynamic Systems Theory by Thalen, 1995. Um, states that several factors interact to inf influence development, both physical and experiential. Um, Cross-cultural studies on infants have reaffirmed that there's a huge range when infants reach various milestones in gross motor and fine motor skills. Please do not panic if your infant child seems to be behind it on a milestone. Physical and experiential development will occur over time and will influence their motor development. Uh, for instance, my son, uh, it was, he was approaching one years old and he was not walking yet. And my daughter was walking by one years old and I was like, what is wrong with him? Why is he not walking? And uh, I, I brought it up to my doctor and my doctor says, well, what happens when he tries to stand? Well, his older sister, who was a year older, would push him and knock him over. And so his reason for not walking be was because it wasn't safe. So it was an environmental situation that every time he stood, his sister would, would be entertained by pushing him over. Um, so he kind of walked like a, a gorilla on his knuckles until he felt safe enough to, to walk on his own. Not a, a physical issue. is more of an experiential uh, issue. Next is uh, ossification. That's the process of the hardening of the bones. Uh, at birth, um, the wrist is all cartilage, and by one to three years of age, it's separate bones. By adolescence, it's made of nine separate bones, um, and this improves uh, a child's manipulative skills over time. So um, the changes in number and density are responsible for improvement of coordination. Next is uh, uh, muscles. Those muscle fibers are present at birth. Um, however, um, the ability to create what's called stamina, um, its ability to maintain activities with the muscles. Gross motor skills are um, exhibit pre predictable changes over time. Fine motor skills, such as a uh, palmar grasp and the pincher grasp, take longer to develop. Um, and again, motor skills follow uh, cephal cephalocaudal and proximodistal development. Remember, cephal cephalocaudal is from head to toe, proximodistal is from near to far. Now, Galloway and, and Thalen in 20, 2004 found that infants can reach for objects more efficiently with their legs, which is the opposite of the cephalocaudal development theory. Okay, lungs and heart. There's rapid growth during those first two years, and which helps the child develop more uh, stamina. And they're able to sustain motor activity without rest by the end of infancy. And uh, cross-culture research is, is pretty interesting, especially on what's called infant uh, precocity. Um, what they found out is that there's a, a pattern of traditional cultural practices that are intentionally and coincidentally promote motor development. Uh, for instance, in Africa, um, the children are, are encouraged uh, more to, to sit up, uh, they're encouraged more to stand, they're encouraged more to walk 
uh, and so thus they, they, they develop these skills at a much earlier age than children in the United States. Um, also the, the Mayan children, uh, if you go down to Central America, you'll see a lot of um, uh, young infants who are in packs on their back and they discourage walking and they, they pretty much attach the child to them for, um, for many months uh, instead of encourage them to walk and follow along. Um, so precocity is the cult, uh, has, has to do with that some infants reach motor milestones earlier than other babies. Um, and cross-cultural studies show how babies of different parts of the world receive, reach those milestones at different parts. And that's a study by Gaber and Dean uh, in 1957. Now, precocity doesn't persist into early childhood, and that's from Lynn, 1998. And that's basically basically because um, parental practices, they, they don't differ as much for young children across cultures. They differ more on how we care for infants. Next is uh, breastfeeding, which is sometimes a, a huge topic. Um, it's substantially superior nutritionally to formula feeding, and this is from Krebs and Prynek and Primac in 2011. Um, children who receive nutrition through breastfeeding, they receive everything they need for the first six, four to six months of life. Um, they're less likely to experience common illnesses like diarrhea, gastro, gastroenteritis, uh, bronchitis, ear infections, and colic, as well as infant death. And that's from Wagner in 2009. Now, mothers should not breastfeed if they're using drugs if they're substance abusers or if they have AIDS, because they can pass on that, um, whatever they take in uh, to, the, to the child, to the infant. And there's a cool little video here about the benefits of breastfeeding cross culture. Um, one reason against um, or for breastfeeding, especially in other cultures, is uh, the quality of the water source in some cultures. So breastfeeding is definitely advantageous. Another one is cost. Um, Another one is, is just the, the health benefits for the child. Uh, let's talk about solid foods. Um, early introduction can interfere with nutrition. It does not help babies to sleep through the night. It should start between four and six months of age. However, contrary to your book, I found that adding single grain cereal to our child's formula before nighttime, when they're around four months of age, it did help our baby sleep through the night because during the middle of the night, our baby got hungry. And by adding that cereal, um, baby didn't get hungry in the middle of the night. Um, but the baby is ready for solid foods when he or she can hold their head up in a steady upright position, when they can sit uh, with some support, uh, where they show interest that they're in what we're eating. Uh, this little chart here shows what's called uh, mal macronutrient malnutrition. Um, and this is where a baby eats a diet contained too few calories. Um, this is a leading worldwide cause of death in children under five. Um, the term uh, marasmus is where there's a severe calorie deficit. Um, it's where the child is, stays extremely small. It can cause permanent brain damage. Another one is called uh, quashier core, and that's where the baby has a diet too low in protein. And then there's a micronutrient malnutrition. This is a little more common in the uh, um, higher income nations. And this is where the, the baby is receiving a deficiency of certain vitamins or minerals. Now marasmus and quashi or core are found in many developing countries. Now industrial societies suffer more from that micronutrient malnut malnutrition and um, such as iron deficiency which could lead to anemia and could impede both social and language development. Now, in the United States, we have something called the WIC program, Women, Infants, and Children uh, in the United States. This helps prevent what's called infant malnutrition. Now, the money you pay as a taxpayer um, saves you money in the long run because that uh, child growing up in poverty um, will be less likely to have learning problems and less likely to need special education later in childhood. Okay, healthcare and immunizations. Um, Vaccinations. There's three for hepatitis, four for diphtheria, te tetanus, and pertussis, uh, three for influenza, and one for measles. Um, the U.S. Uh, vaccination rates are high, 
Um, but they were declining. In 1992, there were only 55% of the children received the full set of immunizations. Now, um, after a few media campaigns in 1999, it was up to 90%. However, there's a need for continued education efforts and government support. Um, please, immunizations are not the cause of increased autism. That was based on a faulty study based on faulty information. The doctor who came up with that study uh, had his license revoked. Um, please remember autism has increased, but is due to the expansion of the definition of what autism is um, and due to the improvement of um, diagnosis. Please don't deny your child these life-saving prevention uh, issues. Please pass the word on that uh, vaccinations are, are good. Um, they're, they're, and that study was bad. Um, daycare babies are twice as many, twice as likely to have what's called respiratory illnesses as stay-at-home babies do. And that's, it just has to do with um, exposure. Now, um, here's a little video here on childhood vaccinations, repeating what I just said. Okay, next, um, in the first two years, uh, we remember we talked about how daycare babies have twice as many illnesses as stay-at-home babies. Um, chronic ear infections, um, babies with that are more likely to than their peers to have learning disabilities, attention deficit, and language deficit. They think um, impaired hearing during key developmental periods may have caused may cause this. Death within the first year of life that's called infant mortality, um, and it was seven babies per thousand, and now um, it's six. Uh, babies per thousand in the United States, according to McDormand in 2013. Um, this rate has declined steadily for several decades. Um, it used to be 30 babies per thousand in 1950. So um, um, we've improved significantly. However, uh, it's higher uh, in the United States than other industrialized countries. So in other words, we are not the highest in infant mor or the best in infant mortality. Um, racial differences also occur in infant mortality. Um, the lowest of infant mortality is among Asian American infants, highest is among African American infants. Now, you might ask yourself, is this, is this because of uh, genetic um, differences or is it because of uh, uh, economic differences? Poverty is still a leading cause of infant mortality regardless of race. So if you take a look at this chart here, Highest infant mortality in the United States is among African Americans. Um, 13 per thousand babies die within the first year. Where Chinese Americans, three per thousand die. Um, so as you can see, these rates vary widely across the United States among um, ethnic groups. And this is from McDormand and Atkinson, um, several long-term studies. Um, you probably might uh, run into someone in your family or extended friends who um, experience a death of an infant. Um, here's some guidelines to support parents who have lost an infant. One, don't attempt to or force talking about grief. Sometimes they want to talk, sometimes they don't. Let them bring it up. Um, refer to their deceased infant by his or her name. Um, express sincere feelings of loss. Follow the parent's lead and reminisces about the baby. Um, the hard part about this is when, you know, if a parent loses somebody who's older, everybody's got an experience of that child and you may reminisce. It's hard to reminisce about, you know, a baby's, your experience with the baby in the first year. So that's, you know, the harder time to, it's harder to associate and talk um, about it, about the loss of an infant. Assure the parents of the normalcy of their grief. It's normal to grieve. It's normal to, you know, even you know, a year later to still be, you know, dealing with them. Don't pressure parents to replace the lost child with another pregnancy. Don't say, well, you can always have another child. It doesn't help with the grief process. Uh, don't offer rationalizations. Understand that grief is likely to affect all family members. So, um, in your book, they talk about Morgan having, um, losing a child within the first year. Uh, how do you think you would behave towards her in everyday situations? What sort of mental script would you develop um, from those recommendations I gave that would be helpful to friends or relatives who lost a child? 
And this might be another question for uh, your threaded discussion. So let's take a look at disparities across eth ethnic groups in prenatal care. Um, remember I told you earlier the highest uh, um, um, infant mortality rate was among African Americans, and it's also they're the less like least likely to um, get health care, prenatal health care. Prenatal health care has to do with uh, visiting the doctor within the first trimester of pregnancy. Um, if you if you notice, there's wide disparities across ethnic groups, um, and and you might notice that there's a reverse correlation um, with prenatal care and infant mortality. Notice that Chinese Americans are most likely to see a doctor within the first trimester, and they have the lowest um, infant mortality. Where um, Native American, African Americans are least likely to get to see a doctor during the first trimester, and they also have the highest level of um, of infant mortality. So you see the connection. And this is from the National Center of Health Statistics, 2006-2010. Next um, is what's called sudden infant death syndrome, or SIDS. Uh, this is a leading cause of death in infants from 1 to 12 months old. Uh, it could be what's caused by what's called apnea or brief, brief cessations in breathing. It could be caused by racial differences that occur in infant mortality. Um, it's lowest among Asian American infants and highest among African American. Um, there's a link I have here that says, what does a safe sleep environment look like? And it's a link to um, um, a government website that talks, um, that, that talks about how to avoid this. you also find this on page 93 of your book. What does a safe sleep environment look like? Uh, place the child on his or her back. Uh, use sleep clothing instead of a blanket or pillows or um, do not have crib bumpers. Um, make sure you have toys out of the sleep area. Um, these are important things. Um, I had a hard time because I would put the our baby on her back and she'd always flip over to her stomach. But um, they do need to have their tummy time so they don't have a flatness on their back so they're not always laying on their back. Um, my son always rolled over on his stomach and slept on his face. He has a flat forehead. <laughs> I tease him about it, but yeah, it's not serious. Okay, um, next is vision. Infants younger than two months show some tracking ability for brief periods. By six to ten weeks, babies have become skillful at tracking. Um, 2020 is like perfect vision, which means you can see 20 feet away and clearly. Um, but at birth, it's about 2,200. In other words, they see what basically what we see from 200 feet away. Um, so it's kind of everything else is kind of blurry. Um, they start gaining what's called color vision, red, green, and blue by after one month. The color sense is almost identical to an adult's. Uh, tracking is a ability for the child to process following moving objects. Um, Initially, it's inefficient, but it improves over time. Um, they're tracking for a short period of time. Um, it, it's, they're, they're able to, to follow a little bit better. By 10 weeks, they become very skillful with tracking. There's a nice little video here on uh, cognitive research on uh, eye movements of the infants. There's a little video down here you can click. Next, uh, hearing. Adult voices are heard well. Uh, High-pitched noises must be allowed to be heard. Some directional sound location is, it, it develops during this time. Smelling and tasting are intricately related. Um, there's four basic tastes that uh, a baby can be able to tell. Sweet, sour, bitter, and salty. <laughs> In this little video, they show um, examples of infant perception, especially taste. We'll put, something, uh, put some lemon juice in the baby's face, and you can definitely see that baby can distinguish sour taste. It's kind of fun. So stop and think, in what ways do baby sensory skills contribute to the development of parent-infant relationship? Here's a nice little video on perceptual and cognitive milestones. But sensory skills help uh, improve interaction with the outside world and thus with interaction with you, the parent. Next is perceptual skills. Um, how does a baby interpret or combine sensory experience? The process is called perception. Uh, the prefer 
preference technique is where the baby is shown two pictures. And researchers keep track of how long the baby looks at each picture. And this uh, study was done by uh, Fance in 1956. Um, another thing, what they study is what's called habituation, which shows a baby, which you show a baby something over and over until the baby stops looking at it. In other words, yeah, I've seen that, seen that, done that. This hab habituation is renewed interest in something that is slightly different than the original stimulus. So if I keep showing the same thing over and over, baby's not uh, interested. If I show something new, um, oh, it's different. They notice it and they start paying attention. Um, operant conditioning is where if you vary the stimulus and study the learned responses, you, you see the child learning. And there's a little video here on habituation. Next is uh, depth perception. Binocular cues are uh, things that involve both eyes. The closer the object, the more the views uh, from the eye, two eyes differ. Uh, information from the eye muscles tell the brain about distance. Now, monocular cues are input from one eye, um, involves interposition, uh, linear perspectives. Now, kinetic cues um, are motion from objects with the eyes. Next is um, the visual cliff, and this is research by Gibson and Walk. Um, recent findings, um, by the way, babies use kinetic information as early as three months. Binocular cues are used at four months. This linear perspective cues are used by babies as young as five to seven months. Um, here's a little video here on uh, experiencing the visual cliff. What he did is um, he took six month old babies, um, he had the mom on the other side of the visual cliff. It was actually a there was a cliff. There was like a glass. Um, there was like a glass to keep the baby from actually falling off the visual cliff. So the baby would, if the baby would keep walking, the baby would walk onto the glass. However, the baby didn't know. Doesn't really see the glass. Doesn't know if the glass would actually hold him or her. Um, what we found out is that um, infants with little crawling experience, they generally don't perceive depth at the edge and will keep crawling out onto the ledge towards their mom. Uh, infants with crawling experience would immediately notice, hey, there's a cliff there, and they have that depth perception developed. So this kind of shows that depth perception is developed uh, by experience, not uh, innate. Um, next is what babies look at, and uh, this is uh, where babies demonstrate a preference for light and dark contrast. Um, Albert Karen and Rose Karen in 1981, they used what's a study on habituation um, where small over big babies find and pay attention to patterns, not just um, specific, specific, specific stimuli. So you'd have um, small things, small things, small things, and also you'd show a big thing and the baby would notice the difference. Okay, so they kind of notice patterns. So initially they notice light and dark, and then they notice patterns of small and big, and then they shift, and eventually um, at three to four months, they're, they're noticing patterns, not just the stimuli. So at one month old, they, um, with words, they can discriminate, discriminate between pa and ba. Uh, at three months, they can respond to male, female, and children's voices similarly. At six months, they can discriminate between two syllable words. Um, at six months also, they can distinguish sound contrast in any language. Um, now this fades out by one year, but babies prefer their mother's voice above all others. Yeah, go figure. Um, very young infants make fine discriminations among individual sounds and pay attention to patterns. Okay, this study uh, I think is a little controversial. It's uh, the study of baby's preference for attractive faces. What he did is he took uh, a bunch of pictures of what adults see as attractive and took a bunch of pictures with a bunch of what adults saw as unattractive. And they put an attractive and unattractive picture in front of the baby, and the baby would stare longer at the attractive picture. Um, I just think what, what they're trying to prove is, um, is attractiveness um, instinctual. And, um, and the question is, is it attractiveness instinctual or is it learned? Personally, I think the baby's looking at the faces that are more similar to the faces, similar to their parents. Um, and of course your parents are always more attractive than anyone else. <laughs> but uh, 
here's a question and say, is this, is this a good research? Uh, what does this tell us about attractiveness? Is it inborn? Um, I really think it's learned. Uh, next is uh, intermodal perception. And this is uh, um, where, where we use, we learn by one sense and we can transfer that to another sense. Uh, for instance, I see something and then if I feel it, I can transfer it to that sense of perception. Um, usually it's common by six months. Uh, this is important in the process of learning. Um, and um, cross-modal transfer is an inborn set of skills that eventually they make connections with different uh, senses. Finally, let's talk about the nature versus nurture argument. Um, nativists believe that um, most of these perceptions are inborn. In other words, those abilities are already present at birth. Where empiricists say that um, these perceptual abilities are learned, um, that we have to have experience. Um, and most people tend to focus more on empiricists that, you know, although we have some compromises, although we have some inborn factors, um, there is that importance of experience to continue learning and developing those skills. That concludes our uh, unit and have a great week.